The Manhattan Project, the race to build the first atomic bomb. In 1939, German physicists had learned how to split the uranium atom and realized the tremendous energy the process could create. With Germany on the verge of another world war, fears soon spread to America that Nazi Germany would utilize the power of the atom to their advantage. When World War II started, Nazi scientists began experimenting with heavy water as a method of releasing the energy of the atom, as heavy water contained more deuterium than normal water. Many American authorities heard about this, but were not alarmed. However, the scientific community considered the threat very real. Many European scientists had escaped persecution by the Nazis by fleeing to America. Among them were Albert Einstein and Enrico Fermi, two of the most renowned nuclear physicists at the time. Leo Szilard and Eugene Widner had also escaped from Europe, where they had seen firsthand the studies of nuclear fission. Both Leo Szilard and Eugene Widner had worked for German laboratories investigating nuclear fission before World War II had begun, and with their help, the Germans created the first instance of controlled fission in a laboratory. When Szilard and Wigner moved to the United States, the Germans already had a significant head start on the Americans in the race to create a bomb more powerful than any other known to mankind. Szilard and Wigner wrote a letter, later named the einstein Sillard letter, which warned the U.S. President, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, about the possibility of the Nazis building an atomic bomb. The letter also said that the U.S. should stock up on uranium and conduct more research into the matter of nuclear fission. Albert Einstein signed the letter, and the atomic research program was initiated. On the 28th of June, 1941, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 8807, creating the Office of Scientific Research and Development to create an atomic bomb. One key committee, the S-1 Uranium Committee, was assigned the task of researching and stockpiling uranium for the bomb. In Britain, scientists Otto Frisch and Rudolf Peerls had made crucial discoveries regarding the critical mass of uranium-235, a mass that could sustain a nuclear chain reaction. The estimates put it at around 10 kilograms, which would be light enough for a conventional bomber of the time to carry. However, they also needed to factor in the weight of the bomb casing and the trigger mechanism, which would add extra weight to the bomb. President Roosevelt created a group to manage the project, called the Top Policy Group, which had only six members. Roosevelt also coordinated the effort with the British due to the fact that they had valuable information about nuclear fission. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, damaging tons of ships and taking hundreds of lives. The immediate outcry of the population led to the United States joining World War II on both the Pacific and European sides. The attack was further encouragement to build the atomic bomb and the S-1 committee met to discuss a method of isotope separation that would be used to separate U-235 from the uraninite. Two isotopes of uranium exist in uraninite, U-235 and U-238. U-235 makes up less than 1% of the uranium in uraninite, and U-238 makes up over 99%. However, only the U-235 can sustain a nuclear chain reaction. There were several ideas as to how to separate the U-235 from the uraninite. The first method was via electromagnetic separation, which works on the principle that charged particles are deflected in a magnetic field. The amount of deflection depends on the mass of the particle. The method, while being very expensive and not very efficient, could allow for high purity U-235 to be separated. The next method was the method of gaseous diffusion, in which uranium hexafluoride goes through a semi-impermeable membrane, causing separation between U-235 and U-238. The process could be repeated many times to an extent where the U-235 separated is very pure. This process could produce U-235 in large quantities and was not very expensive. All the methods were tried out, and the thermal diffusion method proved the best. Despite gaseous diffusion being the most promising, and electromagnetic separation seemingly easy, the thermal diffusion method was used to produce large yields of U-235. However, all the methods were used to increase the speed of separation. The production of U-235 would take place in many facilities across the United States and Canada, such as the Oak Ridge facility in Tennessee. 
Many facilities also manufactured plutonium for use in a later bomb. However, the amounts of plutonium manufactured were extremely small as the only way to obtain plutonium was through cyclotrons. Tens of thousands of people worked at Oak Ridge to refine uranium. Oak Ridge housed a thermal diffusion facility, making it the most crucial to the project. S-50, as the plant was dubbed, started work in September of 1944 and made 10.5 pounds of 0.85% pure U-235 the next month. In June of 1945, it produced over 12,000 pounds of 0.85% pure U-235, enough to build the nuclear bomb. After the thermal diffusion facility in Oak Ridge produced 0.85% pure U-235, it was sent to a gaseous diffusion facility, such as the K-25 plant, located at Oak Ridge as well. At that plant, the uranium would be enriched twice, first to 23% purity, then to 89% purity. The scientists had calculated that 89% pure U-235 would be enough to create the nuclear chain reaction required. Meanwhile, the design for the bomb was yet to be devised. Robert Oppenheimer, one of the most acclaimed American nuclear physicists at the time, was asked to take over the program of neutron calculations, calculating everything about the neutron that would be fired at the uranium. After tensely considering every aspect of the bomb, the team said that it would be possible to build one within a couple of years. Oppenheimer, another famous physicist, gathered at the University of Chicago to discuss how to separate the enriched uranium so that it wouldn't fission at the wrong time. Problems of neutron diffusion and hydrodynamics were key, as much of that information was yet to be uncovered by scientists. Four designs were brought up that fit the design specifications of the bomb. All calculations showed that the bomb could be detonated successfully without causing a propagating nuclear chain reaction in the atmosphere. The British at first were reluctant to share the project with the Americans as two balloys, the British nuclear bomb project, was ahead of the American project. The British refused to give the Americans valuable knowledge and the Manhattan project proceeded alone. However, it soon overtook its British counterpart to the dismay of the British. After investigating the possibility of an independent nuclear bomb project, their engineers said it would not be completed in time to affect the outcome of the war. Soon after the Manhattan Project surpassed two balloys, Britain's Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the US President Franklin Roosevelt agreed to share information about the construction of the bomb. It soon became clear that an equal partnership could no longer happen and America restricted the information going to Britain about the project. Britain was, of course, outraged, but could do nothing about it. By 1943, the British had stopped sending scientists to America, and as retribution, America stopped sending any information whatsoever regarding the bomb. Later the same year, the Americans decided that both Britain and America would benefit from Britain's help in some aspects of the project, and Britain sent over teams of scientists and engineers to help the Americans. Most of the engineers were British, but many of the scientists were not. Among those scientists were atomic spies, people working for the Soviet Union to deliver crucial information about everything related to the bomb. Soviet spies had been trying to get into the project since it began, but with so many British scientists entering the United States on account of the Manhattan Project, Soviet spies were provided the perfect cover. Of the 140,000 workers the Manhattan Project employed, a very small number were Soviet spies. However, the spies managed to get enough valuable information that saved the Soviet Union close to two years of effort in making their own bomb. Many spies were discovered after the Manhattan Project had already been finished and were sentenced to years in prison. After all the calculations for the bomb had been completed, the project headquarters were moved to Los Alamos, New Mexico. Oppenheimer owned a ranch near Albuquerque, New Mexico, but the vicinity was surrounded by sheer cliffs which the engineers feared could cause flooding. Another site near the Los Alamos Ranch School seemed perfect to both the engineers and Oppenheimer, and the site was chosen. After finding out that there would be enough U-235 for the bomb, the team of scientists started work on making the instrument that would start the fission reaction. They had chosen the gun-type design for the bomb, even though they knew that bomb type was inefficient and prone to accidental discharge. 
The gun type fission bomb works by splitting up the critical mass into a bullet, a chunk of uranium that would be fired, and a target, what the bullet would hit. When the bullet hit the target, a modulated neutron initiator would fire several neutrons at the now critical mass of uranium. This would start the fission process. After the first bomb was assembled, the team got to work on the second bomb they would make. They planned to use plutonium for the second bomb because plutonium was both highly fissile and easy to make from U-238. By bombarding U-238 with a neutron, they could create another isotope of uranium, U-239, which would quickly decay into an isotope of neptunium, then into plutonium-239. However, the cost of creating so much plutonium was near $1 billion, and technology for it had to be adapted from old nuclear reactors, as little was known about the isotope of plutonium they would be using. The bomb design also had to be changed because the bullet-type bomb would not work with plutonium. A new graphite reactor was made at Oak Ridge. Named the X-10 reactor, it was originally built as a model for the reactors that would be built at Hanford. The site contained several support buildings, a chemical separation facility, and the reactor. However, since the reactor built at Hanford was water-cooled, only the chemical separation facility acted as a model. The X-10 reactor was made of a block of graphite surrounded by several feet of concrete that acted as a radiation shield. The graphite block had over 1,000 holes drilled into it where uranium rods would be inserted. The graphite would act as a moderator for the neutrons that were being fired at the uranium rods. Several problems arose with the reactor, but the biggest problem was that the uranium rods would corrode when exposed to air. Additionally, the uranium leaked fission products into the cooling system. After the problem was solved with fluxless welding, the reactor went critical in 1943. By the end of November 1943, the reactor had produced 500 milligrams of plutonium and was well on its way to creating all the plutonium required for the bomb. After the uranium rods were pushed out of the reactor, the plutonium had to be separated from the uranium. The plutonium would be oxidized to two states, plus four state and plus six state. This oxidized plutonium would be put into bismuth phosphate, which would cause the plutonium particles to sink to the bottom of the tank, while the uranium would not. The first designs for the plutonium bomb were also gun type, but the scientists soon realized that the gun type bomb would not work with plutonium. Reactor plutonium contained too much P240, which would start the chain reaction too quickly. If the reaction started too quickly, very little of the plutonium would fission and would instead disperse. Oppenheimer prompted for a different method that would involve a subcritical mass of plutonium surrounded by conventional explosives. The explosives would compress the mass, thereby making it critical and even increasing its efficiency. However, it would be much harder to design the implosion method. One of the biggest problems was encountered in placing the conventional explosives so that they would exert equal pressure on the plutonium core. The explosives had to explode at the same time and with the same speed to exert equal pressure, so the scientists decided to use an explosive called Composition B for the fast explosive and Baritol as a slow explosive. Having two sets of explosive lenses gave the bomb more precision. Even though the lack of plutonium for the bomb meant that it would take several months to finish, Oppenheimer and several scientists and engineers wanted to see how the implosion weapon would work. The risk of the bomb malfunctioning was simply too great, and additionally, a successful detonation would enhance the position of the new president, Harry Truman. The test was planned by Kenneth Bainbridge, who chose the Alamogordo Army Airfield for the detonation site. Bainbridge planned for the site to have army barracks, warehouses, and workshops. There would also be cameras located at different locations around the site, which could capture video at over 1 million frames per second. Before the actual atomic bomb was detonated, another test was done using 100 tons of TNT spiked with nuclear fission products. It was detonated 800 feet from the Trinity site on May 7th to help physicists roughly understand how the Trinity explosion would behave and for the camera crew to set up the equipment. The fireball was seen from 60 miles away. The plutonium bomb, nicknamed the Gadget, was lifted to the top of a 100-foot tower as this would generate less nuclear fallout 
and maximize the energy applied directly to the core of the bomb by the explosive lenses. Originally planned for 4 a.m. but postponed due to rain and lightning, the bomb exploded at 5.30 on the 16th of July 1945, with a force equal to 18,000 tons of TNT. Word of the successful test soon reached President Truman in Germany, just months after the Axis powers had surrendered. However, the Japanese were still at war with the Americans in the Pacific, and Truman ordered two atomic bombs to be dropped on two major cities in Japan. The Manhattan Project knew that the bombs they made would be used against Japan in the war, and training had already started months ago for pilots of the planes that would drop the bombs. The cities of Hiroshima and Kokura were the original cities that would be bombed. The Little Boy bomb was dropped on Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945. Weather conditions prevented the bombing of Kokura on the 9th of August, and since the plane could not turn back, the city of Nagasaki was chosen instead. Over 180,000 people died in the bombings of the two cities. Countless buildings were destroyed and the two cities were almost wiped off the map. The world had entered the atomic age. Thank you for watching this video, and as always, if you enjoyed, leave a like or favorite, share it with your friends, or you could even subscribe for more educational videos.